Okay, well, good uh, morning, good uh, afternoon, or maybe even good evening. I hope everybody can uh, can understand me well. And um, so I'm uh, Tim De Boek, uh, and we're uh, in this session today on uh, API security. And I'm going to give you uh, uh, an approach, let's say, uh, to API security that is uh, that is actually based on uh, on risk. Uh, hello, Tim. Before uh, you do that, I can maybe provide a short introduction to you okay. and this session, if that Perfect. sounds good. There was a bit of delays uh, for me to be able to join as panelists, so I'm here now. <laughs> so I'll just give a short brief intro before we can take it away. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, welcome to OWASP uh, EPSEC EU 2022 and the exhibitor track. Uh, my name is Kristina Devochko and I will be, I'm a volunteer in the OWASP community and I will be your moderator for this session today. Um, during the next 45 minutes, you will be listening to uh, Tim Debeck, who will present uh, the session on a risk-based approach to API security. So please submit any questions you have during the session in the Q&A tab just to the right of this video in the Whova platform. I will be asking Tim your questions in the last 10 minutes of the session. Uh, Tim Debeck is a solutions architect with no name security, and he advises customers on technology and process best practices to mitigate risks originating from applications and APIs. And prior to no name security, Tim held similar roles at Palo Alto Networks and IBM with 25 years of experience in information security and enterprise security architecture. So are you ready to take it away, Tim? Yes, I think I am. Thank you, Christina. Awesome, thank you. Perfect, and I, I suppose everybody can see the screen, right? Uh, this is my first session, so uh, I'm not sure everything works. Um, I, I can see it, just a heads up. Okay, perfect, thank you. Then uh, let's, let's go. Um, so um, yeah, again, thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Um, the idea for this session is to give you an insight into, uh, into API security, but we're going to take a, a risk-based approach. And so uh, in, the, uh, in the session here, we're actually going to discuss uh, some of the challenges and risks that actually come with the traditional application security architectures. And uh, we'll also explore some critical capabilities for a modern risk-based approach to API security. Um, focusing on the entire API uh, lifecycle. So that's kind of the abstract for today. Um, Christina already uh, was kind enough to, to introduce me, so uh, I'm not going to go into the details here. Um, so let's dive in. And um, what I'd like to do is, is, first of all, kind of set the scene um, so everybody's on the, on the same page. I'll, uh, I'll give a brief introduction on, you know, uh, what is an API, uh, first of all, and then we'll dive into, uh, you know, an understanding of, uh, of risk. And uh, we'll, we'll explore what that means in the context of, of API security. So um, as uh, many of you will probably uh, already be familiar with, with, with APIs, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, just for your reference, if we are talking about an API, uh, we, we talk about uh, an application programming interface. It's, uh, it's uh, something that basically facilitates communication between uh, software components, between applications, between devices, um, by, by offering a standardized interface through which functions and data are easily accessible. Um, as an example, you know, everybody has, uh, has mobile apps on their phone. Um, all of these apps actually are, you know, in the in the background, are accessing APIs to obtain information to to give you certain types of functionality. Um, for example, you know, checking the weather or um, making transactions uh, through your financial institution. Uh, everything uh, of those functionalities is today actually enabled by APIs. On a more technical note, uh, an, an API or a server-side web API, because that's essentially what uh, what we're talking about here, is a, is a programmatic interface, and uh, that interface exposes endpoints. And so each endpoint can take requests, and then will return a response. And that response can be uh, data, if, if, if you're querying a, a data system, or it could basically be uh, informing you that, that you know, you've successfully run a function 
uh, you requested something to to happen in the in the underlying system, um, for example, checking a credit card number, and then the response would come back and say it's a valid credit card number or it's a, it's a fake credit card number. Um, these are examples of how you can use APIs today, <clears throat> and um, we'll go a bit more into you know what what the consequences are of that. Um, obviously, you know from uh, uh, from a uh, let's say uh, usability or or prevalence perspective, uh, we have some, some figures here uh, that actually give you some insight into, you know, what the, what the let's say, level of magnitude is uh, of, of APIs being used today. And <clears throat> from that, you know, uh, from that respect, we can see that, uh, for example, today, if, if you look at API usage, the, uh, the usage is actually um, increasing exponentially. So we did a survey recently with the 451 group, um, and uh, we, we actually asked them to, you know, uh, do a bit of research, uh, query a lot of uh, a lot of people in the field, and uh, you know, come come back with a set of data that we could use and and pour into a report. And so from from the report itself, we actually see that over the last 12 months, for all the people that we've interviewed, um, they they saw an increase of of over 200 percent of uh, APIs being you know, created and deployed in their environment. Now, with that greater use, that greater scroll of APIs, um, you can obviously expect that uh, that will trigger an interest from uh, people with, with you know, rather malicious intentions. And so we also see that you know, attacks against APIs are increasing. And so again, from that same study, um, we, uh, we recorded that basically in the last 12 months, 41% um, uh, of, the, of the respondents had actually seen uh, or experienced an API security incident. And out of those 41%, 63% uh, actually experienced a data breach or uh, data loss as a result. Now, if you do the math on that, um, that actually means that one in four of the people that we interviewed was actually the victim of a data breach caused by uh, an API uh, security flaw or an API security vulnerability. Uh, one in four over a period of a, of a year, that's, that's not an insignificant number. And so it's, it's also for that reason um, that uh, you can see analyst firms like Gartner uh, really uh, basically saying that APIs uh, are the next big attack surface uh, when we come, uh, when we look at, at uh, at threats from from cyber criminals, for example, and so Gartner in their in their in one of their latest reports uh, where they look at the cyber threat landscape for 2022, uh, they actually designate APIs as uh, high momentum attacks, which means that they're no longer anecdotal. So uh, it basically means that uh, these are attacks you should take into account uh, for the next you know, couple of years, and um, they will not they will not decrease. They will only increase. So that's kind of a you know a bit of background on you know where we are with respect to APIs, and um, now I'm going to explain a little bit about you know how we're going to see this in the context of uh, of, of risk. Um, so you know first of all, you know, really quick introduction on on what is risk because there's there's you know various ideas about you know what constitutes risk, and I've taken some definitions here from NIST and from uh, from FAIR and from uh, uh, ISO, um, they are slightly different, but also in certain ways the same. Um, basically, NIST and FAIR they see uh, risk as a as a function of you know, certain elements, and um, those elements uh, largely are the uh, let's say the likelihood of occurrence of a of a certain event that might happen, um, and the adverse impact that that event has. Um, so, you know, that's that's what NIST basically has a definition for risk. Um, FAIR, which is an institution that, you know, looks at risk quantification, uh, basically includes also um, the, the assets and the controls that you have. Um, but in the end, it, it, it basically comes down to the same thing. Um, you are at a chance of, you know, suffering from an event that would cause an, an impact to your organization um, that may be you know, significant for the organization. Um, ISO takes a bit of a, a, a different angle. Uh, they say, you know, risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And, and in a certain way that also, you know, applies to what we're going to discuss here, 
um, because right now, if you look at, at, at API security, there is, I would say, also a lot of uncertainty about what API security should be uh, in order to, you know, to be successful in, in mitigating risk. So that's kind of you know, setting the scene. And I'm going to go uh, a little bit more into the details now, you know, just to basically take you on a journey and explore risk a little bit further and, and then see you know, how we can apply that to uh, uh, how it relates to, to API security. Um, so if you, if you look at risk and you look at the core elements that constitute risk, then you know, first of all, there is the, uh, you know, the probability of something happening. So the likelihood uh, of occurrence, uh, as, as NIST calls it. Um, and, and, and there you can you know, look at how often you expect a certain event to happen. So for example, the, uh, you know, the figures that we, that we collected through the interview um, where you know, companies suffer from a data breach, you could say that you know one in four companies um, on an annual basis suffers from a data breach, so your your probability would be around twenty five percent. And then the second element uh, for uh, you know uh, calculating risk uh, is actually the the impact that a particular event uh, would, would would trigger uh, to your organization. So um, if you look at probability and you you dive a little bit deeper, um, there obviously you see that probability is, let's say, driven by, on the one hand side, uh, a particular threat, and on the other side, uh, you know, the, the, the attack surface that is exposed to the threat. And the impact will be driven by uh, a particular loss event. So that's, that's effectively what happens if the, um, the, uh, the threat successfully exploits a vulnerability on your attack surface. It can trigger a particular loss event, such as a, a data breach, for example, and that implies a certain cost to the organization. And so you can go a bit more into the details. You can dive a little bit deeper if you then explore what effectively makes up a threat. Then you can look at the, uh, you know, uh, first of all, the threat actors. So, you know, the folks that are actually carrying out uh, the attack. Uh, but also their motivations and uh, the, the, the techniques, tactics, and procedures that they're using. So the tools that they're using and how they operate, um, all these elements together, you know, make up the, the, the elements of threat. On the attack surface side, you can, uh, you can then start looking at, you know, your API footprint uh, specifically. And then obviously um, APIs are, you know, the, the first element of your attack surface, but then those APIs also bring certain vulnerabilities to the table. Um, and uh, basically, your infrastructure can also be uh, at risk of, uh, of, of misconfigurations. Uh, so something that we very often see is, uh, is you know, control components that don't work as operated uh, or as intended. And so you deal with misconfigurations there as well. And then on the, on the impact side, if you look at uh, potential loss events, um, you know, first of all, there is a data breach, uh, obviously, because that's the one that uh, most companies will will incur as part of uh, as part of an attack. Uh, most companies will suffer from a data breach, uh, at least in in the API security context. That, that's what we see with customers. But there's also other types of loss events that that could be uh, detrimental to a company. Um, Things such as, for example, service disruption. If you if you bring down a service, that could mean a loss of revenue, and so uh, that could be just as as much of an impact uh, in the end as uh, as a data breach, or maybe even bigger. And then there's other things like uh, function abuse, where you know regular uh, functionality that is offered through an API is is being abused for purposes that were not in the original intent of of that uh, API. Um, I just gave an example of, uh, of, of credit card validation. Um, that's a good use case for you know, uh, cyber criminals to, to start using a function like that for their own, you know, for their own benefit in, for example, validating lists of stolen uh, credit card numbers. And so again, that may have an impact uh, that may you know, uh, be tied to a particular cost for the organization. Now, if we look at cost, then, you know, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is the um, is the financial cost. 
Um, that's that what most organizations will be worried about in the first place. But then besides financial costs, there can be other types of cost implications. There could be you know, damage to your reputation, uh, which may in, in the end also again result in, for example, loss of revenue uh, and, and again contribute to that financial cost. And then in certain cases, um, you could also deal with, with, a, with a human cost, for example, if, if, you're, if you're looking at uh, industrial IoT, for example, um, if you deal with uh, a, a breach there and certain functionality is impacted, that could effectively uh, result in uh, loss of life or uh, people getting injured. So this is, you know, at a, at a very high level, how, uh, how we look at risk and, and what the different elements are that uh, basically uh, constitute risk. Um, what I'm going to do now is, you know, take a little bit of a deeper dive and, and then um, look at, you know, first of all, the, the different loss events uh, and the potential cost implications and, and how you can use those to determine the impact. And then we're going to take a closer look at the, the probability itself, again, in the context of APIs, and see how that may basically help you or guide you in determining the overall risk that uh, your API landscape brings to the organization, because that's, you know, that's ultimately the goal. Now, if you want to uh, determine impact, then you know, obviously you'll need some more information on what exactly is it that uh, my organization is doing, what, what type of business are we in, what is uh, generating or driving our, our, our revenue. Uh, and, and there it really depends on, you know, again, the type of organization that you're in. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to predict for, you know, any particular organization, what their core risks may be. Um, we did that for a certain number of customers in the past, but you're always surprised to see that they take a, a different angle from time to time and um, their you know, prioritization of risk may be different from what you expect. Um, so here, you know, if you look at the, 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 the impact drivers, obviously in, uh, in the context of an API, as we discussed already, um, there is, there is, the biggest potential is data theft, or that's at least what we're seeing today. Um, a lot of the breaches result in, uh, in data being lost or data being stolen. Uh, so that's potentially the, the biggest driver for everybody. Uh, but then, as I mentioned, there's, there's other drivers or, or other uh, types of loss events, um, such as service disruption, function abuse, uh, account takeover, uh, that could in the end also result in you know, lost revenue or uh, reputational damage or uh, you know, potentially fines uh, from, from the government, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is you know, the first step that you typically take is, uh, is just trying to assess what type of loss events will create the biggest impact for my organization. Uh, and you can say, for example, a retail company may suffer more if, if ordering is disrupted, uh, whereas a bank uh, will, will typically focus more on financial fraud. Um, but again, some of these loss events may be very specific to your business. Others uh, may be more you know, broadly uh, applied, uh, and, and data theft is one example. Now, if we then look at probability, and, and, and this is something where you'll have a lot more elements to, uh, to deal with, if, if you now look at probability um, and, and look at what you need to know in order to estimate the uh, the probability or the likelihood of occurrence of a you know a successful API attack, then first of all there's the threat actors that you need to be aware of. Now these threat actors are no different from you know threat actors that we see in in, in other types of attacks, like you know for example uh, for ransomware attacks. Um, you have cyber criminals; they're in there for monetary gain. You have uh, activists that basically look in the first case to do or to create brand damage. Then you have nation states with, with, with nation states which are, um, let's say, far more experienced and equipped. Um, and in, in in many cases, they will, you know, their their first core objective is to uh, gain a competitive advantage over other countries, for example. Uh, and then you have uh, opportunistic um, hackers, let's say, um, where you actually don't really know what you're going to face. It, it more depends on the type of vulnerability they can export. 
so that's on the on the threat side, uh, and then you have, of course, the uh, the attack surface itself, and there, you know, the, the first uh, element to take into account is the uh, is the APIs that you have. Um, there can be, you know, many different types of APIs in your environment. You can have managed APIs. You can have shadow APIs that you don't know about that they are still up and running. Um, there may be unmanaged APIs. There can be third party APIs. Um, each of these will, will offer a certain functionality, whether it's, it's to the general public or to your partners, or maybe to just internal uh, employees. Um, but each of these are a potential target uh, for the threat actors that we just discussed. And then besides the APIs, obviously, you also need to focus on the vulnerabilities that, um, that can be exploited on the, you know, the uh, the vulnerabilities, the misconfigurations um, that that could be present because of these APIs in your environment, and so that actually brings us to let's say the first challenge that we observe um, in let's say the, the 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 organizations that we talk to is that there is a, a lack of awareness about what effectively today is important uh, to define or to help define uh, the API attack surface. And so the reason there, or let's say the observation that we uh, that we see is that uh, that that lack of awareness is basically preventing companies from, in the first place, making the right assessment of where their risk lies related to their API landscape. Um, as an example, here I've I've taken the uh, the the uh, well-known OWASP top ten. Um, where you know if 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 you ask around during uh, during customer meetings, for example, um, pretty much everybody is aware with aware of the of the OWASP top ten. But if you then say that there is a there is a, a counterpart basically that is specifically focusing on on API issues, um, then in many cases you uh, you can see that people are not aware uh, of of you know of the fact that there is an additional API top ten. And, and they're even you know, far less aware of you know, what, what makes up that top 10, what are the typical issues that you see uh, in, an, in an API environment. And so while there are you know, similarities, there are you know, certain types of issues that actually uh, exist in both, or that at least make the top 10 uh, in, in each of these lists. Um, these are the ones that, that I've highlighted in green here. Uh, you also see that there are, uh, quite a few issues that are really specific to APIs, um, such as the uh, broken object level authorization issue, which, which currently still stands at number one, um, which is the, you know, the most common uh, vulnerability or the most common problem that leads to uh, data breaches these days. And so you know, this, this is already the first uh, challenge that we see is because you don't know of you know what actually is important to know uh, when we talk about API security. It's 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 very very let's say difficult to assess the, the 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 or to get a good estimation of that probability. Right? Where are we vulnerable if we don't know what we're looking for in terms of vulnerabilities? So. The first thing that we, uh, you know, that we that we absolutely need to tackle is is, is the awareness problem, um, and then of course you can uh, you can you can start diving into what is exactly needed. Um, but then the other thing is that if we look at, for example, the OWASP API top ten, um, for us this is a starting point, right? This is something that that every company should be looking at today. Um, but it's just a starting point, right? It's it, it shouldn't be the end goal. You can't say, I've now covered the uh, you know the the, the 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 items in this list, and now I'm going to be you know perfectly safe from API attacks, because that's you know that's not how obviously security works. Um, this list dates from 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 2019, so it's not that old. But obviously things change, certainly in the domain of security. And um, we can already see that there are other issues that you know, are going to surface in the, uh, in the next coming years in terms of API security um, that are currently not in that top 10 list. But so again, you know, uh, from an awareness point of view, uh, this is a, 
you know, a good point to start. Um, just, you know, do the reading and, uh, and, and look at what applies to, uh, you know, or what might potentially apply to your environment. Now, in order to actually get there, I'm going to go through an exercise where uh, we're going to look at a, a particular threat scenario. And we're going to look at, uh, in this case, you know, uh, a scenario of uh, PII data theft. Um, again, in the context of, you know, how, how APIs might contribute to such a scenario. So, again, as, as, a, as a first, you know, step in this exercise, um, what you typically do is you look at the loss events that are, you know, critical for your organization. And so, in this case, it's, uh, it's data theft. And we know that you know, for data theft, there can be fines, there can be brand damage, there can be lost business uh, as, a, you know, as a result, as a cost implication. And if we look at you know, who the most likely threat actor is you know, for that scenario, it's, uh, it's cyber criminals. And so then the only, the only elements that we're missing here are uh, you know, the, the elements that constitute or that make up our attack surface. And so here you can look at you know, all the different, uh, or you can include all the different uh, types of vulnerabilities or um, you know, attack techniques that might eventually result in uh, data being stolen. And these you know, vulnerabilities, they can apply to you know, a number of APIs that you have in your environment, whether they're public or partner or, or APIs you don't know about. Um, you just list, you know, what applies to uh, to your specific environment. Now, with this, you have, you know, the first step in that uh, in that exercise. You you basically listed all the all the components that that contribute to that particular threat scenario, and that you can actually, in the end, use to to calculate the overall risk. Um, but the 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 part that you're still missing today is effectively how you can leverage controls to reduce not only the, uh, the, the, the impact of an event, but also the probability of a, of a particular event. And so, you know, before we, we go into, you know, going to assess or to try to estimate the actual um, likelihood of, of, of any of these elements in, in, in our specific uh, scenario, uh, we're going to need to take a look at you know what controls can actually be of use uh, for this particular scenario. And so uh, this is just one example, uh, by the way, data theft because it's the it's the most common one. Um, there's other scenarios as well, such as uh, you know account takeover or uh, or service disruption. Uh, but obviously the uh, you know the methodology is the same. Um, you always make up you know what elements you need to, 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 to contribute to that particular threat scenario. And then you're going to look at the controls that you need to effectively um, mitigate that particular risk. So this is essentially where we, uh, where we start talking about controls. Um, the controls are there to, to, to help you mitigate risk, to, to you know, uh, limit the probability or the chance of something happening. Uh, in the first place, but also to help you limit the uh, the potential impact. So you know, um, making sure that if there is a data breach, for example, um, that you can detect it early and prevent maybe many many records from leaking out. So if you, know, if you keep it small, the ultimate cost will effectively also be uh, be reduced. Now, if we again look at the example of uh, of, of data theft. Um, then you know obviously you know certain controls will come to mind. Uh, what I've done here is is I've actually taken the um, the NIST CSF as a as a framework here, um, where we you know we look at these five pillars, these five stages: identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And so for each of these stages, we're we're going to list the type of outcome that we want to have uh, that will then help us you know complete that threat scenario exercise. And so, for example, for identify, you know, the questions to ask is, do I have the tools to perform uh, uh, an, an automated API inventory and, and make sure that, you know, as part of that inventory, I also uh, identify the data types that are exposed to these APIs. We're talking about data uh, theft here. So we absolutely want to know what APIs could actually, you know, contribute to the risk of data being stolen. 
for data being lost. And as part of the identification phase, we also want to look at the vulnerabilities that essentially could contribute to that, uh, to that type of loss event. In the protect stage, we, uh, we're actually going to look at um, the, the controls that you can use to protect your APIs to really prevent attacks. So here you need to take into account, you know, um, what do we have in the, in the OWASP top 10 in terms of, of you know, critical vulnerabilities or, or vulnerabilities that are most likely to be exploited? And, and how do I protect against that with my current control set? Okay. And then you have the, the detect phase, um, which is, I would say, equally important. Um, and there, we absolutely want to have a capability that helps us identify a data breach early. So we want to make sure that whenever there is a data breach, and, and specifically for APIs, um, uh, it, there is an opportunity to, to, to do detection and to interrupt the leaking of data at an early stage. So we absolutely need a capability that helps us identify data data breach. Um, the only difficulty that will that you will face here is that the the data breaches that happen through APIs they happen over a longer period of time, and um, in many cases it will just look like regular traffic. So you need some type of capability here that will allow you to identify, um, let's say the the anomalous behaviors uh, from the regular traffic. And if you then look at uh, the, the the response stage, because you know once you've detected that, you need to have some control or some possibility um, that will help you limit the, the the magnitude of that loss event. So basically, to interrupt data from leaking out, um, you need to have a mechanism that allows you to do that. And finally, in the recover stage, um, what is really important there in order to you know restore your business and, and prevent such an event from happening again is you need to have full visibility into um, who was basically targeting you uh, what were they doing how are they doing it um, and uh, you know at what time were they doing it so you can actually reconstruct the timeline of the event and you can basically adapt your your defense mechanisms to make sure that this type of event cannot happen again so once you've asked yourself all these questions and you, you have an answer uh, to, to, to those questions in terms of you know, what controls you have, you can then complete the threat scenario exercise, um, again, for, for, for data theft in this case. And uh, you know, one way of doing it is, is going over each of the elements and indicating to, you know, to what degree of, of um, or to, to, to what degree of likeliness that this particular element will be, let's say, important to the overall uh, risk calculation or the overall threat scenario. So I'll give the example here. If um, you know you take the uh, the, the point of uh, data theft, um, very likely that we're going to be targeted by uh, by cyber criminals, and um, if they attack us from the outside, uh, our public APIs and potentially shadow APIs. Uh, might be in their focus okay so very likely they will go for one of those if we then look at the uh, at the vulnerabilities um, you can then take into account what controls you have that will actually already you know prevent certain vulnerabilities from being exploited um, for example if you have a, a good authentication control in place then you can mark that one as green as it's you know not likely to be uh, an initial target um, same, for example, for injection attacks, if you have a web application firewall and um, that, that's been put in, into protection mode, then you can have a certain level of guarantee that injection attacks will not, will not work, will not succeed. Um, but for other types of, of vulnerabilities or, or attack techniques, you may not have a control or you, you may not know that you have that particular vulnerability. And, and as an example, broken object level authorization, as I already mentioned, is, the, uh, is, is one of the most common uh, vulnerabilities being exploited. It is also very difficult to, let's say, protect against it from a traditional point of, of, of view, from a traditional signature-based approach. Uh, you need other mechanisms that will actually help you uh, detect such an attack based on you know, how your APIs actually work. 
So, you know, in this example, you can say, oh, we don't protect against uh, against BOLA or we don't know how to protect against BOLA. So that's, you know, going to be a highly likely target uh, for these uh, uh, attacks. And then obviously, as a, as a result, you'll have a loss event. Uh, in this case, again, it's data theft. Um, I put it as highly likely because we have already kind of a broad attack surface. There is a good chance that this loss event will happen. And if it will happen and we don't have the right controls to detect and, and, and mitigate it, um, then obviously it will result in uh, a serious financial cost. So that's how I typically go through uh, you know, an exercise like this. Um, this helps you know, customers understand where their, their, their vulnerabilities are, um, where their deficiencies may be in terms of, of controls, and, and also you know, where they may lack you know, for example, the, the, the knowledge about certain vulnerabilities that they haven't thought about and, and maybe need to take into account when they build their roadmap for, uh, you know, improving API security. Now, that essentially brings us to uh, another set of, uh, of challenges. And, and, and this is where, again, we see with a lot of customers that, that there is a, let's say, a misconception about, you know, what controls are actually useful to, uh, to, 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 to you know, protect your API environment today. Um, and there's a few things that have come out of the, out of the report that we, um, uh, that we coordinated with the uh, 451 research group. Again. Um, you know, where you see that, for example, if we focus on the secure development of APIs, um, a lot of customers or you know, a third of the, of the survey respondents said that they had um, delays in, in, in projects because of API security concerns. Um, and it's it's basically a lack of tools there that that would help them deliver secure code into a production environment um, that would you know give them a guarantee that you know whatever they push into production has been has been vetted has been validated through the right set of checks um, and they don't have the the right tools today to actually do that so when they're about to release something in production the infosec team or the appsec team comes up and says, "Well, you know, if you don't, if you haven't done these and these checks, then you know we cannot authorize that uh, that code to go live." So the need there is is really to have uh, security testing of APIs being done in advance, um, and uh, you know, obviously that's that's part of your secure coding uh, application development lifecycle. Uh, but there needs to be collaboration between the uh, application and infosec teams on the one hand side. And application development on the other side, so you cannot put the responsibility in you know one group or another. Um, you need to basically you know bridge the silos together because otherwise you're never going to have an effective uh, an effective process to uh, in the end deliver secure code into your environment. A second type of um, challenge that we see today with customers is, is around posture management. Um, and this is you know, really important, again, for that risk assessment exercise. Uh, you need to have a, a good inventory of your APIs um, so you can actually use that inventory to, 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 to include it in your risk assessment. And you need to very well understand what APIs are more critical in terms of certain loss events. Right? If you take the example of data theft, you really need to understand how data, how you know, sensitive data is linked to the APIs and how they are exposing that data to the outside world. Um, and then, of course, beyond data, um, your inventory should, should include other characteristics as well that are relevant to your risk assessments. Um, for example, does an API have authentication? Is that, is that authentication functioning properly, for example? Um, is that API an internet-facing API or not? And, and how many, let's say, consumers are, are using the API? And are they, you know, for example, all using a cell or is the API exposed uh, through uh, you know, just regular HTTP? Um, so all these elements basically help you identify how an API could potentially contribute to a particular loss event and will help you assess the, uh, the, the risk that an API brings to the organization. And then the last, uh, the last challenge that we, that we very frequently see is, is around the, what we call the runtime security. It's, it's, uh, it's basically protecting your APIs from, uh, from attacks. 
And again, here we see that there's like a, you know, a misconception of, of what actual security controls can bring to the table today. Um, again, because of the lack of awareness that I mentioned initially, so um, there is that difference between the, uh, the regular OWASP top 10 and the OWASP API top 10. And if you look at you know, what's in that API top 10 and you then start looking at all the different controls that customers typically have, then you can see that a lot of the legacy controls are not well suited to deal with these, uh, with these uh, let's say, vulnerabilities or these attacks that are in the API top 10. So, you know, if you, if you really want to tackle that problem, again, you, you need to go through that exercise, that threat scenario exercise, as I said, identify your loss events, identify what could trigger these loss events and, and how these vulnerabilities would, would, would you know, be leveraged uh, in such a scenario. Um, but then more importantly, uh, as I already mentioned, if you want to have that, that holistic approach to API security, um, you must combine it with security testing on the one side to, to remove vulnerabilities before they go into production. But then on the other side, uh, on the defense side, you also need to have that active monitoring detection and prevention um, in production, basically to deal with any, any vulnerabilities that slip through or that might be um, you know, related to third party development, for example, um, and eventually end up in production. So in terms of recommendations, if we, uh, if we now again look at our, uh, our NIST uh, CSF framework, uh, what is required for, for each of these stages, um, this is a you know, pretty comprehensive list of, of, let's say, outcomes that you must realize um, through your uh, controls. And so again, if we, talk, if we talk about you know, the, the identify stage, it's important to really identify every API including you know, uh, all the data linked to the API, including the misconfigurations and vulnerabilities. And that will give you a good idea um, how to you know, rate the probability of something happening, of the probability of, of, of you know, an API being breached. Obviously, there's the protect side as well. Um, so in protect, you can basically use controls that will shield your APIs from attacks. Um, Things like, for example, making sure that you have access control in place, that are only the right people can access an API, making sure that all the uh, you know, common threats and, 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 for example, bots are blocked and things like DOS attacks are being blocked. Um, now, these things are actually, let's say, the, the items that most customers already have, or for the majority, they will have controls that can, can focus on these items. And it's there that the misconception lies that you know, if, we, if we have this in place, then we are protected. Again, here, if you look at really the more advanced attacks, you may see API attacks that look like genuine traffic where your, your um, protect capabilities, your protect controls will actually not bring a lot of value to the table. And so that's where we move to uh, detect and respond. Um, because for those type of attacks, for the, uh, you know, the more advanced attacks, like you know, uh, attacks that, that actually target business logic flaws, um, you need to have a model where you can actually look at transactions, API transactions over a, a longer period of time and basically filter out the, uh, the anomalies that you see uh, from the analysis that you're doing of all that, of all that traffic. And so this is really the you know the next the next level type of uh, of detection that you will have, um, and you will also need to couple that with uh, data exfiltration um, discovery or detection techniques, uh, because obviously if you uh, if you are in a data theft, in data theft scenario, um, again the data will most likely be leaked out over a longer period of time. A regular DLP solution may not be able to catch it because it it looks like genuine traffic. Um, and so you need a more advanced type of detection that is actually looking at uh, API specific behaviors to be able to take that kind of uh, that kind of activity. What is then equally important uh, once you are detecting something is that you can uh, respond to the um, the events that you detect. Um, and so here, if if you look at solutions, look at something that uh, that can. And maybe on the one side do automated blocking, um, but on the other side that also integrates well with your uh, existing incident response workflows. 
Um, so what we see with a lot of uh, a lot of customers is that the you know the the, the SOC teams that actually um, man uh, their 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 incident response um, they don't have proper insight into what is going on uh, in the environment, and that's not only true for for API specific environments. It's it's you know a common pain in in, in security. Um, is that the, the quality of the information that ends up in the SOC is, is typically not of a very detailed level for them to really understand what is going on and, and to really take the right action. So really important for that response phase is that, that they get the right information, that they can take the right actions based on that right information. And then finally, if you go into the, the recover stage, um, there obviously, you know, you're trying to restore your environment. Um, the first thing you probably want to do is if you have been breached through a particular vulnerability is make sure that that vulnerability is fixed and you deploy an unvulnerable API version. Um, but then obviously also uh, very important is that you learn from what has happened. And, and so that's why the, you know, the logging is really important that you can recreate that timeline. You can recreate what happened and you can improve your policies and, you can, and your controls based on that. And then ultimately, if you are, if you've been the victim of, of uh, you know, an attack that had actually had a, an impact on your data where your data was um, maybe modified, for example, or a system was brought down, is that you can actually restore those systems and the data. Um, again, you know, very common uh, to have that type of, uh, of capability. Uh, again, not specific to API environments, but it can happen in, uh, in API environments as well. So this kind of, you know, constitutes or, or uh, sums up the, you know, the recommendations that we have uh, from, from our side based on you know, what we see in, in, in real life uh, when we talk to our customers and, and basically what is also being confirmed in the research that we're doing. Um, make sure you have a, a holistic approach that you know, basically covers every aspect uh, of, of API security and don't, for example, only focus on uh, protect to, you know, to prevent attacks from happening. And with that, I would say thank you very much for, uh, for listening to this talk. Um, I think we have about 10, 11 minutes left for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I'm not sure, Christina. Yes, yes, Tim, first. Yes, first of all, thank you so much for a great uh, presentation and extremely interesting and important uh, topic. Uh, seeing uh, more than 60% of respondents uh, having experienced uh, the, the breach and uh, the data leakage uh, due to lacking API security is pretty, pretty scary, I uh, need to say. So it's, uh, it's very good to to bring awareness to, to this and how we can improve the security of the APIs. So we have a few questions. Uh, first one is, what's a great way start learning API security with GraphQL and gRPC coming in? How this will change? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, we see that as well, and it's uh, well, without going into product specifics, it's it, it's something that we are looking at uh, actively. Um, I would say they, you know, they will present new challenges. They will bring new challenges to the table. Um, we are looking into it from our perspective in, into how we can resolve it. I would say the, the you know the, the 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 first step for everybody is just to understand again what these new ways of, of you know, uh, creating APIs or delivering APIs are, is all about. Uh, so you know, educate yourself and then try to use that knowledge into assessing what you currently have in terms of protection and, 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 and making sure that if you need new controls uh, that it is part of the conversation. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, then another question is that you showed a really interesting threat uh, scenario on P uh, personal identifiable information data theft. So 
How often would you recommend uh, to execute threat modeling like this? And are there any resources that can help you on the way uh, that will make it easier to kind of perform such type of threat modeling? And who should be a part of such an activity? That's, yeah, very, very interesting point uh, you have there. Um, I think threat modeling is definitely uh, the, 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 the good approach here. Um, what my take on it would be is that you can you should do it as often as you can, uh, and obviously that's a challenge by itself because you know uh, APIs are being released at a at a very high rate, and and APIs are changing all the time. Um, but from a let's say from a frequency perspective, I think you can you can gain a lot by using tools that help you automate that exercise as well. And, and by automating, I mean that, you know, do a lot of the work for you. I, I think a lot of the, you know, threat modeling being done today is based on knowledge that people have or knowledge that, that people think they have about an environment and about threats. And I think if you, can, if you can automate that process by, I would say, ingesting the right types of information about your environment, then you can probably increase the frequency as well. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's 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 mm. something that we are, you know, definitely advocating for is that use use tools to do the you know the the the, the dumb work, let's say, and and use tools to assess your environment as 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 often as possible in an automated way, and then leverage that information to to update your threat models based on you know what you're currently seeing in your environment. Mm. Would you recommend developers being part of this uh, this activity, the ones actually doing the development of APIs? To be part of the of the threat modeling activity? Yeah, or yeah. In general. Yeah, yeah, of the threat modeling activity. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think they can bring a lot of value to the table as well um, because they know their code best, and and they can probably give you, you know, a good perspective on. What are they looking at from a, from a development perspective? Are they taking into account, for example, the, 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 the specific API vulnerabilities? Um, if, if you start off from the, uh, from the wrong model, you can easily develop an API that becomes very vulnerable. And that should be taken into account when you do the threat modeling. Hmm. Yeah. Um... Sounds really reasonable. And uh, while we are talking about developers, right? So you mentioned during your session that um, uh, sometimes or very often you have the tight timelines and developers are really uh, uh, focused on kind of getting the functionality delivered and uh, as soon as possible and before the deadline. And then you may face these situations where, for instance, a security team or security champions can say, hey, but this was not validated in this and this way. Way and we uh, uh, we can't we can't uh, allow it to be uh, to be released and then the developers get really frustrated because they needed to get it out in production for the customers yesterday right so mm -hmm. what uh, so it's uh, it is a challenge to make developers also be really um, conscious about security kind of understanding full understanding the focus of it so would you have any recommendations on how you can break these silos, how you can make developers as an as a security champion, for instance, how you can make developers more conscious about about API uh, security? Yes, yes, uh, that's uh, definitely one of the problems to uh, to solve. Um, I, you know, I think you put it rightly when you said there's 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 probably too many silos uh, in there. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing with customers that you know one practice that is emerging is to create uh, let's say api security program teams that that are jointly responsible for defining standards and architecture so um we see that we see that in 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 us organizations there you know it's it's becoming a fairly established uh, practice uh, we also see that it's you know starting to happen in in emea as well uh, but I think that's the first step, right? You want to involve everybody, and uh, the developers are part of the are part of the solution. So they should be part of that API security program team that that you know uh, defines the standards around what API security means, what a what a secure architecture look like. 
and then probably it will also be very will will also be easier to um, let's say define KPIs around that or, or based on those standards and to achieve those KPIs. Hmm. So collaboration is, is is definitely key here. Yeah. And shifting left, I guess, to start to start to do in the security evaluation, uh, the evaluation of potential threads of these APIs you are going to create before you actually start creating them it is also sounds like a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but when we talk about about uh, shifting left, it, it, it's, 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 it's on the one hand side, making the developers more aware of, of the security implications of the code they write, um, but, but it all starts with the right framework, right? And they also need to have the tools to, you know, to be able to validate their, their applications or their APIs against specific vulnerabilities. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I mentioned quite often already is, is that is these authorization problems um, that, that is basically a result of the, of the, of the wrong initial architecture. And, and sometimes developers are not aware of it, right? Because they develop one piece of code in, into a broader um, uh, set of APIs. And so you need to have some testing tools at the end that can tell you whether or not you are vulnerable for these, um, you know, for these specific exploits uh, against your APIs. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And then uh, I think we have time for one last question that just popped up. Uh, the question was about any tools, about any tool recommendations uh, you have, which we are talking about here. It um, that's, uh, that's, that's also <laughs> a fair question, I would say, and I, I cannot speak for, uh, for the tools that we offer, of course. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's a bit of a tough, <laughs> tough question uh, to ask in this case. Uh, yeah, I, I would uh, say base, base, base the tools that you that you use on the on the risk assessment exercise that you're doing and on the vulnerabilities that you're trying to detect. Because um, you, you have tools like, uh, you know, the, the SAST and the DAST tools, um, they all have their use, they will all target certain vulnerabilities. Uh, but in the end, it comes down to, you know, which ones are really important for me and for my organization. Uh, again, depends on the risks that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to mitigate, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yes, but uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Tim. I think we've been through all the questions and we just uh, have a minute or so left. So I would like to thank you once again for a really interesting session. And uh, thanks to all of the participants who have joined this session with us today.